Session 8, Challenging the Comfort Zone. Chapter 2, verse 8 to 17. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke. He said, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in, in our land. The fig tree puts forth its green figs and the Vines with tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, come away. Oh, my dove in the cleft of the rock, in the secret place of the cliff. Let me hear you, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, because your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine, for our grapes have for our vines have tender grapes. My beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Till the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of Bether. Chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, she faced her first spiritual crisis, which was sin as a veiled woman with an unkept guard, a vineyard, Chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord proclaims over her, do not disturb her. But now the season has changed and the Lord is now disturbing her. There's the voice of the Lord himself, the voice of my beloved, she says. Chapter 2, verse 8, she is confronted with her second spiritual crisis. But this time it's not scandal and sin, it's fear. She's afraid to go forward. She's in the comfort zone, and the Lord wants her out in the place of risk. We don't know how much time passes between verses 7 and 8. It's a clear different season. To one person, it's a, a, a one time frame. To another, it's a much longer one. This is the third revelation of Jesus in the song. He's revealing himself as the sovereign king over all the nations this time. But notice in chapter 2, verse 17, she refuses. She tells him to turn and go leap on the mountains without me. That's basically what she says. The issue before her is this, the very end of page 1. Is Jesus a safe God? Is he safe to obey 100%? In the flesh, sometimes it seems safer to be in the boat without Jesus instead of being on the water with him, using the analogy of Peter. The question is, is it safe to go with Jesus out of the comfort zone? That's the question she has to face. This is a very, very real and practical reality in all of our lives. Is 100% obedience really safe? It seems so costly. It seems outrageous. It seems impractical. It seems violent. It seems painful and horrible. Is he really safe to obey 100%? Will we miss out? if we obey him 100%. Third revelation of Jesus. He shows himself as the sovereign king. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon mountains, skipping upon hills. The young bride has an entirely new revelation of Jesus as a sovereign king. She sees Jesus as the Lord of all, effortlessly conquering all opposing mountains. Up until this point of time, she has understood Jesus as the counseling shepherd, as the affectionate father, or expressing the heart of the affectionate father, sitting at the table, feeding her grapes and apples in the shade tree, you know, the banqueting table, under the banner of love, etc., etc. Now he's awakening her heart to a new season with a new voice, a new I mean, it's, not a, it's, his, it's the same voice, but, but with a new message, a new season. The voice of my beloved, she recognizes it's the one that she loves, but it's, he has an entirely different face. He cries, behold, he's 
getting her attention. Same thing he said at the Laodiceans when he said, Behold, I stand at the door. He's shaking her up. He's, a, he's a, making her aware that something very, very dramatic and very definitive is, is uh, being communicated to her. Jesus is seen as the Lord of the nations and the Lord of the harvest. Jesus the King overcomes all human and demonic obstacles. The mountains speak of obstacles that, that hinder her faith and obedience. He's leaping on mountains. He's skipping on hills. Mountains are symbolic of human or demonic obstacles here. Jesus said, whoever says to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, does not doubt it in his heart. He'll have what he says. The mountains are obstacles, whether human, natural, or demonic, human or, or demonic obstacles. And Scripture also speaks of mountains in context to natural and spiritual governments. Since a mountain is very large and immovable, it provides a picture of government. It can speak of the Spiritual government, as in powers and principalities, as well as natural governments of the nations of the earth. And I just give you just a few verses where mountains are pictured as government. Hills. He's leaping over mountains and hills. The hills speak of, her, of personal difficulties. They're much smaller than the mountains. She sees him as a gazelle or a young stag leaping and skipping on mountains. He's pictured as effortless in his effortless victory over all enemies. He's leaping and skipping. Nothing can stop him. This buoyant energy, effortless victory over every obstacle. He's just bounding over them with no fear, with no effort even, is how he uh, shows himself. A gazelle is an animal that is fast, especially swift, in sudden, energetic movements. A gazelle can run easily on the high places. The gazelle is the picture of the effortless ascending up the mountain. Jesus said, mountains, human or demonic, are no problem to me. I effortlessly can abound over them, and I want you to come with me on the mountains. This speaks of Jesus as triumphant. The, uh, with an energy and agility to overcome everything, skill and ability, power. He's the young stag, the energetic stag, full of, of, uh, of energy and strength. But, uh, uh, same thing, skipping over mountains. He's the fearless, conquering every obstacle is how he's showing himself forth. The wall of protection and isolation. She says, he stands behind our wall. He is looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. He is standing, pictured as ready for action. He's standing behind the wall. Now, the, the Lord is normally pictured in Scripture as sitting. He's especially pictured as sitting in heaven, sitting in the place of victory and dominion. But here he's standing it's a description of Jesus taking action. Whenever the Lord stands, He stands for action. When Stephen, the first martyr, died, the Lord stood up and received him, but it's more than just He received him. The book of Acts is unfolded in natural history. When the Lord stands, He is prepared for action. He's showing Himself forth as active in power. Now, he was standing specifically to receive Stephen, but he shows himself as standing uh, at, before the Laodicean church, knocking on the door. And with the Lord standing, he's about to intervene in, in a dramatic way in natural history. So the Lord is standing, but she says he's standing behind our wall. Jesus is seen as standing behind a wall. She thinks he's behind a wall. But the truth is, he's out in the vast open world, skipping on mountains. She's behind a wall is what's happening. She goes, Lord, you're behind the wall. And the Lord says, no. You're still at the table in the house, under the shade tree, protected from all difficulty. It's a wall of self-protection that shuts the world out with all of its problems, all the needs of others. It's a wall that keeps her from the risks of walking in faith. Now, the interesting thing, 
which I say through the rest of this, is she says it's our wall. The, the Lord is responsible for this wall because he's the one in chapter 2, verse 7, that told everyone, don't disturb her. I want her just here in this season. I don't want her out real busy right now. In the last session, we didn't have time to develop it, but I talked about uh, using the natural calendar as four seasons. I talked about the, the summer, uh, uh, the spring, summer, autumn, and, and uh, winter. And in the spring seasons, the Lord sows new truths in our lives. And new truths are pretty exciting. The summer season, well, we're working in the hot sun, cultivating the truth. And there's a, there's a certain joy of growth when things are new things grow, but there's a labor under the hot sun. In the autumn, that's the harvest, and everybody likes the harvest. But the Lord ordains the winter seasons as well. Because without the winter seasons, the, uh, the, the cycle doesn't work. And a lot of people imagine God always is dealing with them in one season. They have a one seasonal God in their understanding. He's always the God who's ready to end, you know, the, the conflict and to bring the harvest, the full harvest. And well, it's 2,000 years and the end time harvest hasn't come yet, not because anybody's failed. The Lord hasn't brought the end time harvest in because it hasn't been time to bring it in. And the Lord has corporate seasons through all of history, and He has individual seasons in our life. He's the one that put her behind that wall. He didn't send her to the mission field yet. Some people think if you're obeying God, you're going to the mission field right now. Well, that's every season in the Lord isn't the same season. I've had seasons that are so radically different, and they go sometimes a couple of years. And it's typically the... Uh, 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 well, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's natural to assume whatever season you're in is the season that your friend should be in. It's very, very, I, 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 as a pastor, I run into that all the time. The conflict that comes where, well, I'm in this season, is good. Well, why aren't they in it? It's just like, it's the, uh, uh, you know, the projection, the mandate projection, projecting on others the season and mandate God gave you. And there's very different seasons. And even the same person has very different seasons. Well, he put her behind the wall. He told all the daughters of Jerusalem not, not to disturb her. He goes, I want her there for, for an extended season. I want to absolutely make her lovesick. And then I'm going to, in that place of lovesickness, I'm going to use her with me to skip on mountains and hills. He calls her out of the comfort zone to co-labor with him. He says, my beloved, rise up. Come away. Come with me is what he's saying. She's looking at him jumping on mountains, and she says, come with me. And she goes, she says to the Lord, I don't like heights, Lord. <laughs> I don't like mountains. I like grapes and apple trees and shade trees and tables and beds. I don't like mountains. Jesus continues the divine romance as he's wooing her. As he's calling her, he's wooing her and training her. He says, my love, my beautiful one. It's, the, it's that twin, it's that, that twofold statement he says so often when he gives a command. The command is rise up, but look at the, the romance of God's heart. He goes, you look good and I like you, so come forth. You look good, I like you, rise up, obey me now. We imagine Jesus saying, you're a hypocrite and you're about to go to hell, so rise up. I don't like you, and you look horrible, so you better obey me. That is truly the Jesus most people imagine. When he says, rise up in a place of difficulty, when he's challenging you out of a place of comfort, he says, I like the way you look, and I like you. Now come with me. And most people simply do not have a Jesus that talks to them that way. They have a Jesus that brings the whip to them, and threatens them with devastation, but the Jesus of the Scripture is wooing her in love. That is absolutely essential. Because not only do, do we, uh, as a rule, not respond by that kind of motivation, because, I mean, it, we don't uh, understand that's how the Lord's drawing us. We're imagining a very different kind of God. Then we communicate that wrong image of God to the people that we minister to and impact. We tell our story, oh yeah, God was about to, you know, to, to, you know, do all these negative things to me and I finally said yes. And then our, the young 
The young ones in the Lord, that's the image of God they walk away with. When the Lord says, rise up to a sincere heart, he says, you look good and I like you. You're beautiful and you're my love. You're the one I love. I like you and you look good. Now, obey me. That's the bridal paradigm of the kingdom. Obey me because you look good and I like you. I tell you, it's a lot easier to obey in that understanding. He speaks tenderly to her. It's not natural for a man to speak tenderly and softly and with kindness. Natural, fallen, sinful man is harsh and rude and judgmental and complaining and warning and threatening, but he woos with tenderness. He's so different. Now he calls her to arise, to come with him on the mountains. She's sitting at, the, at Jesus' table under the shade tree on the bed, eating grapes, I mean apples. And he says, come walk on mountains with me. He's calling her to leave the comfort zone. The difficulties of leaving the comfort zone. She doesn't like the risks of walking by faith. I like that John Wimber used to say, he says, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. That's why people don't like giving money to God in the support of the kingdom. They're so afraid that the invisible God will not interact with them. The, the money arena just absolutely shuts our heart down. We're so afraid of risk. We're so afraid of doing something where we might not get ahead circumstantially or relationally. We're so afraid of risk. And yet the Lord, the very thing he wants to prove himself faithful to us is in the place of risk. He woos us all the time into the place of risk. I don't mean just to outlandish things. Some people think that they're obeying God best when they're doing things that don't have wisdom in them. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about out of the comfort zone, and it means a dozen things to a dozen people. The comfort zone speaks of the struggles of spiritual warfare coming out of the comfort zone. Because, as I, as I have uh, written here on, in chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, on those mountains are, are leopards and lions devouring animals are on those mountains. She discovers those in chapter 4. There's lions and tigers and bears on the mountain. There's leopards and lions and everything up there. It's real. Warfare's real when you get out of the comfort zone. You'll say, well, let's stay in it. No, because Satan wants to devour us one way or the other. The only place of safety is in the place of obedience. And then the inconveniences of service is, is one way that the Lord calls us out of the comfort zone. It's just sometimes a burden to the flesh to serve people. He says, I want you to embrace the risks of faith. I want you to embrace the struggles of warfare. And what I mean by embrace the, uh, 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 embrace the struggles of warfare, I, I don't just mean go to a prayer meeting and engage in spiritual warfare. That's not what I mean. Although certainly that's, that's a good thing to do. What I'm talking about is when you touch Satan's kingdom, there is a negative counterattack Satan comes back with. And those of you that have been uh, uh, on the front lines even a little bit, you know there is a cause effect. There is greater pressures when you touch things that are important to Satan's kingdom. There really, really are attacks that come. And the attacks most, not, most, uh, not only, but one major way is through uh, relational conflict. The, the enemy will cause people, even good people, to be enraged against you. And just like, wow, I'm getting off the front lines where, you know, just people were nice to me. Jill, you know a little bit about the front lines, don't you? <laughs> Jill is... How many years have you been in ministry? Over 20. Jill's been on the front lines. And you say stuff and just people get real mad, don't they? For no reason. They just really get mad. And they, and they put it in books and tapes and tell everybody else. You know, it's just like, that's warfare. That's part of, that's what happens when you stand on the front lines. It doesn't have to be in a big public arena. 
like she experiences. It can be at the office or in can be in the home group. You're taking a stand and you're doing something. All of a sudden, rah, you, you do something for the Lord in obedience. And even the believers will be disrupted. A number of them will. Because if you obey the Lord, the, the implication is, the very clear but unspoken implication is, they should too. The enemy takes advantage of that context. He encourages her, prophetic encouragement, by the signs of fruitfulness, the signs of the times, if you will. Jesus prophetically encourages her by revealing to her it's the time for the harvest, it's time for fruitfulness. The Lord is equipping her to overcome fear so she'll be able to rise up to follow him. She's still immature in her understanding that Jesus is a safe God. She knows that he's fragrant and beautiful, but his, is he safe to obey 100%? The prophetic signs are right before her. This is, a, this is a fantastic passage. Jesus now, he says, arise in verse 10. Then he says here, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over, the flowers are appearing, the singing's begun, the turtle dove is in the land, the, the fig trees are putting forth its green figs, the vine, the vineyards, their tender grapes, give a good smell, rise up. And then he repeats again in verse 13, he tells her again what he said in verse 10, he goes, now rise up. Jesus is reminding her of his faithfulness to her in the past, he says, lo, he goes, let's reason together. He says, the winter is past and the rain is over and gone. He looks at her and he says, I was with you in the winter, wasn't I? You made it through the winter. You didn't think you would make it through the winter, the cold, bitter rains of winter, or the winter season. You didn't think you would make it. But he goes, look, we love each other. You trust me. I love you. We love each other. The winter's past. Hey, we're still together. You're there, aren't you? Your heart is still alive in me. It wasn't so bad as you thought. The Lord appeals to his dealings with us in former seasons, past seasons in our life. He says, remember those seasons. As, remember chapter 4, verse 1, she said, I will remember your love. We will remember your love. That's one of the main things that uh, throughout the book, the Lord is constantly drawing her attention to the way, the way that he, he dealt with her in kindness and in tenderness. And this is one of the ways he's reminding her, the winter's past, the rain's over, and they're still together, and he was faithful to her. One of the things the Lord is uh, trying to do is, the Lord is establishing in our life, he's giving us a, our own personal history in the faithfulness of God. I look back over some 20 plus years, and, and I can remember the breakthrough and the provision and the faithfulness, and the Lord said this, he did that, and I look back, I go, well, Lord... You were faithful to me. And the Lord says, I was leading you back in the 70s and 80s to give you a history, a personal history in how faithful I would be to you. I was writing a history with you. The two, or I was helping you write your history in God. And that I draw on that history now when I look at the future. But you know what? You can't, you know, it's the old saying, you can't have a victory without a struggle. We get in the winter seasons, we get in the hard rains, and we just want to quit. And the Lord says, no, no, don't, because you're going to draw on this history in the future. He goes, watch, just stay there, so hang in there, and I'm going to deliver you, and you're going to have another chapter in your book called Your Personal History in God. Your own private book and your own book of faith in the Lord. Now he's giving her uh, signs, prophetic signs of the soon coming harvest. He says the flowers, the first thing he says, the flowers are appearing upon the earth. The appearing of flowers are a sign of the harvest in the natural realm. When the flower appears on the apple tree, the apple is, comes just a little bit down the road time-wise. Just a little more time and the apple, once the flower's there, the apple will be there in just a little bit of time. The flower appears on the vine just before. The grapes come forth. These flowers, he says, the signs of the harvest are all around you. The flowers are budding everywhere that you look. The first stages of the harvest have already begun. The time of singing is here. The joyful celebration associated with the harvest is beginning to break out. The winter's over. The singing is beginning. 
The celebration of the Spirit is already at hand, even right now. In 1998, it's at hand right now. He's saying to the, the body of Christ across the earth, the flowers are budding across the earth in natural history. I'm showing you that around the corner is the great harvest. The full fruit hasn't appeared on the tree, but the flowers right before the fruit are, are appearing right now. The first stages of harvest have already begun. The voice of the turtle dove is heard. The voice of the turtle dove was heard in the land of Israel at the harvest time. Just right before the harvest time, the turtle dove. The dove began to coo. It was just, it was a natural cycle. Just in the natural. And they, and it was the signs that in the agricultural community, they, they knew what time of the year it was. The winter fruit is matured through testing. The fig tree puts forth her green figs. Figs grow in the winter time. Figs are a winter fruit. The fig now is green. The, the fruit from the winter season is now, it's not mature. It's only green. It's just budding. He says, can't you see what hour you are in right now? He says, can't you see it? The vines give a tender, give, uh, the vines with tender grapes give a good smell. Again, the grapes are tender. They're they're young, they're budding, they're immature, they're, they're, they're not mature yet, they're not ready. But the smell is already there. The Lord repeats for urgency. Rise up! I love you. I lo you look good and I like you. You look good and I like you. Now obey me. I gave an example. We skipped it a couple pages back, but I'll just uh, throw it in now, is that uh, G in John 4, Jesus told the apostles that the, uh, he says, the, the fields are white for harvest. And he was giving them the signs of the harvest. What he meant was the book of Acts is about to begin. Now, they were not leading a lot of people to the Lord. They were not establishing mature disciples or anything really at that time. Jesus was telling them all the signs are present right now. He goes, the Son of God is in flesh. He goes, that's the big sign. Redemption is about to be accomplished. And you don't even know what the book of Acts is yet. He could have told Peter, James, and John. But it's going to be written in just about a year or two. It's going to be begun. I mean, it's not going to be written, but it's going to begin. The day of Pentecost is only about a year or two away. And he begins to give them the signs of the harvest. And he's telling them, he says, I want you to be ready to, to rise up now because if you learn how to walk with me now under pressure, in a year or two, when the great Re Jerusalem revival breaks out, you're going to be needed for leadership then. And what's happening in the body of Christ, the Lord's calling many, many people, I believe, into this, into the romance of the gospel because... I'm just pulling arbitrary numbers. In five or ten years, you're going to need to have this as a reality in your spirit for the difficulty of the day. And it's very, very difficult in an hour, in a moment's time, to develop depth with God. And he's saying right now, I believe the body of Christ worldwide, press in. Press in. Can't you see all of the signs of a harvest are budding everywhere. The beginning signs of a coming harvest, they're everywhere. And yet the body of Christ in the Western world is still just living in their over-saturated uh, lives of recreation and entertainment and leisure. The body of Christ is not just the world. He's saying... Don't you understand that natural history is about to, write, about to wind up? The devil's about to rage. I'm about to pull my glory out. My judgments are going to shake the earth. I need my people standing in their place, deep in God, and you're all just interested in, in doing your little things. He's speaking to his church. Can't you see the signs? Rise up. Develop your history now because you're going to need it in a short amount of time to be able to bring reality to people in crisis and in need. You can't develop a history in God in a moment's time. You can't bring shade to others without a little bit of depth. And I believe in 1998 we have sufficient time right now to go deep with God now before the, the crisis of history begins. The crisis of history is just the, the pressures of the harvest itself. The pressures of the 
of the, the uh, Satan's rage against the end time harvest, the Lord's temporal judgments loosed on the earth. Those things are, are massive pressures, positive and negative, but the workload is intense, and the Lord wants lovers. And some of God's people are going to say, okay, I'm ready to work, but they're not going to have love built into their spirit, and so the work's going to wear them out. When you begin to labor hard as a worker and you're not a lover, the work wears you out and burns you out and bruises you and hurts you. It's, that's what happened to her in chapter 1. We work hard. We keep all the other vineyards, but our own vineyard's not kept. He, he wants to romance her and he wants to establish her in this bridal paradigm of the kingdom. He wants to fascinate her heart so that the work actually can refresh her spirit, though it might weary her body. Because in, in the romance of the gospel, what happens, we carry the reward in our heart with us. When we're enjoying the romance of the gospel, people can treat you wrong. You can be in prison, like Paul said, but his heart was overflowing in love. He was carrying the reward inside of himself. The reward wasn't just easy circumstances by liking him. The reward was the the. The ability to receive and feel the love of God and the ability to love back with all of his heart, to enter into the romance. That's what I believe is the strongest reward in this age. The ability to walk in the romance internally. And when, it, when all the disappointments come, something is strong on the inside. Right now when the disappointments come, relational difficult uh, disappointments, circumstantial disappointments, it burns out and breaks God's people because they don't have much on the inside buoying them up. When the external things disappoint them. Beloved, right now, the, the fig tree is putting forth its figs. The vines are putting forth tender grapes right now. The, the singing is beginning. We're seeing here in the Western world, and we're the last, nearly, of the nations that have been touched with the gospel. All around the third world, the, it's already moving powerful. But the signs that there's a few... Revival centers have broken out. Toronto and Pensacola and a number of others. The Lord says, singing is beginning. Can't you see what's happening? It's time to enter into abandonment and radical uh, lifestyles before the Lord. He's telling her, he says, I was with you in the winter. Why are you afraid of the mountains? I was with you in the winter and it's past now. I was with you and we're together. He goes, why do you think I will abandon you in the mountains? She's going, uh, I don't know, Lord. This is just new. I, I, like the, I like the couch and the wall and the, and, and the shade right now. I, I love being lovesick. Don't mess it up. It's a good thing, Lord. And the Lord's answer to her is, I want you to enjoy me, but I want a mature partner. You're my inheritance. The goal of life is not just to feel my presence. It's to work as my inheritance, as my partner, alongside as my bride. Some people think that the ultimate is just feeling the presence of God. Oh, I feel His presence. That's it. No, beloved, that's chapter 1. <laughs> chapter 1 is feeling the presence of God in power on the inside. That's chapter 1. That's a means to an end. Although in some ways it's an end in itself. The, the, very, the very experience of love in the heart of God is in some ways an end in itself. And yet, at the same time, He wants a partner, not just somebody who feels the presence of God. He says, I want you to work with me. He says it again. My love. I love you, my Pharaoh and my beautiful one. She's struggling. Now, now remember, the grapes are tender and the figs are green. She's immature, but she's beautiful to God. She's immature. Remember in chapter uh, 2, verse 1, she's the lily. Her purity is in the gift of righteousness and her willingness. It's in her cries and her heart. She's not mature in her life. She's still green and, and, and immature in her life. He looks at her, he says, hey, I understand you're, you're still immature right now. The work of God in the nations is budding. It's immature and she's immature. And we're going to see her declare her own immaturity in a, in a moment here. But the point is, he calls her, I love you and you look good. I like you and you look good. Embraced in her weakness. The Lord reveals his tender affection. He declares her beautiful in her struggle of fear. He calls her to confidence in a time of weakness. 
He knows right here in verse 14 that she's going to refuse him in verse 17. The Lord already knows it. It's the same thing with Peter. The Lord told him in the garden, pray, Peter, seek me. You're going to stumble tonight. But Peter, you have a willing spirit. It's the same thing going on. He's looking at her saying, I love you, and I know you love me, but you're going to be tested. It's, it, to me, it, it's, it's very similar to what's going on in Peter's life that we looked at the other day. He calls her my dove, her sincerity, her purity, her, her single-mindedness. He goes, I know you're in, I know, I know that, that you want to do what's in my heart. I know that I see you are my dove. You're the one with spiritual vision. He affirms her sincerity here. He says, oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock. The clefts of the rock speak of the finished work of the cross. It's very important here. Jesus is the rock of God. He told Peter, upon this rock, he was talking about upon the declaration of his Messiahship. Number two, Paul the apostle taught Jesus was the rock even in Moses' day. Calls Jesus the spiritual rock. Number three, this is the, the uh, imagery of the cleft of the rock. I'll just describe it to you, verse, read it to you. What's happening in Exodus 33 is the Lord tells Moses, I'm going to show you my glory, Moses. Except for there's one problem. In Moses' human condition as a sinner, the glory of God would destroy him. The Lord says, my face, you can't see my face, it will destroy you in your sinful human condition. He says, here's what I'm going to do. Moses is on the mountainside, and the Lord causes Moses to hide, it says right here, in the cleft of the rock, in a, there was this, uh, like a, a hiding place, the Lord cuts out of the mountain. And hides Moses, he puts his hand over Moses, and the Lord passes by. This is a picture of redemption. Jesus is the rock, and the clef of the rock that saved Moses, that saves us, is the wounds in Jesus' side. Jesus is the rock that is wounded, and when we hide in the cleft of the rock, we're hiding in the, the, atoning, the, the, the atoning death and sufferings of Jesus Christ. I develop all of that through uh, page 16. That he wants her hiding in the cleft of the rock right now. That's in the, the wounds of Jesus. And I develop how you can uh, uh, come to that understanding. He sees her through the resurrection. Oh, my dove, in the secret place of the cliff. Of the cliff. Let's look at the imagery of the cliff. The King James translates it, the secret place of the stairs. The New American Standard, the secret place of the steep pathway. The New King James, the version we're using here, is the secret place of the cliff. It's the secret, the secret ascension upward. It's the stairway to heaven. Whether it's the stairs, it's the secret pathway, it's the cliff up there. It's a secret, it's secret and it's ascent upwards. It's what it's talking about. Jesus is calling her to God with confidence in her weakness. He says, I want to see you in the cleft of the rock. I want to see you in that mysterious place called the resurrection. I want to see you in the finished work of the cross, is what he's describing here. He wants to see her face. He wants to hear her voice. He goes, in your weakness, I want you to stand in the cleft of the rock, in, the, in that mysterious ascent upward that no one understands, which is a picture of the resurrection. It's the secret, mysterious place in God. He goes, I want you to stand there, and in that position, I want to hear your voice for help. Don't go develop some religious scheme to present yourself to me. Let me hear your voice in that place, in that place only. He's calling her to a place of confidence in her weakness. He says, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. He goes, I want you to cry for help in the finished work of the cross. 
because your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. He says, I know you're going to deny me in verse 17, but right now I want to hear your voice. Don't draw back from me. Press into me. Let me hear your voice. Let me see your face. I love to hear your worship. And she's going, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. He goes, worship me. Don't draw back from me. Don't shut down right now. You need my help right now. I know who you are. You are my dove. Stand in the cleft and in the secret place of the cliff, in the mysterious place of the resurrection. Stand in the grace of God and don't draw back and ask me for help, is what she's saying. You are my beautiful one. You are my dove. Now let me hear your voice. And what happens when we get in a place of struggle and we get filled with shame and it shuts our voice. Shame shuts our voice and we feel ugly to the Lord. We feel like a hypocrite. And he says, no, I want to see your face because it looks beautiful to me and I want to hear your voice because it's sweet. Sweet, I'm struggling, I'm failing. How can my voice be sweet? And the Lord, and then the four things I described earlier, the four reasons why the Lord sees us beautiful even in our immaturity. It's the thing that he told Peter. He says, Peter, your spirit's willing. He says, I love your spirit, Peter. You have weak flesh, but there's a cry in your spirit for me. I see it, Peter. Now he told Peter, now pray, press into me. And Peter fell asleep. And then Peter was filled with shame afterwards. Her prayer for deliverance from compromise. She goes, okay, I will pray to you then. I will let you see my face and hear my voice. She goes, Jesus, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine, for our vines have tender grapes. This is the place where she's declaring her own vine is, is immature right here. She's still in a place of immaturity. And the overall picture of the song she's declaring, she goes, my vine is, is still tender. It's not mature yet. Her desperate cry to God for deliverance from the small areas of fear and compromise. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes. The foxes are cunning little animals that destroy the vineyard under the cover of night. The foxes are not bold, strong lions that attack in the day. They're quick, they're subtle, they're crafty, they're hard to catch. They come when nobody can see them under the cover of night. They're very, very difficult to catch the little foxes. You can catch the lion and the bear because they're op out and open. But the foxes come when you're weary and it's dark and they're crafty and they're fast and you can't see them. And she's acknowledging. Verse 4, she goes, I can't do it alone. The Lord says, let me hear your voice. Ask me for help. And she goes, okay, catch the foxes. Help me, help me. My vineyard is being destroyed like it was in chapter 1, verse 6. My vineyard might end up unkept if you don't intervene and help me this time. My vineyard's being destroyed by, now what's happening now, it's not, she's not being threatened with, the scandal of the veiled woman. That's not what's happening. It's not a scandal this time. It's the little crafty areas that are destroying her deep, her depth in God. Beloved, it's the little foxes that destroy, that don't ruin our reputation. It's, her reputation is not a problem like chapter 1. It's not a scandal. It's, she wants to go deep. She wants the, the, the Lord to sustain her and to embrace her. And she's lovesick. She wants to go deep from chapter 2, verse 5. And the Lord's communicated to her, these foxes will keep you in a state of being superficial. You'll never go deep with me. Your vine, your life sources are being dried up and destroyed. The deep, the, the depth in God will never, never happen. And she understands that. And I, and I developed those ideas here. She wants to go deep with the Lord. But the vines still only have tender grapes, immature grapes. She goes, Lord, help me. Help me. I want to go deep with you. I don't want to just avoid scandal. I don't want to just live business as usual, Christianity with, you know, clean morals and that's it. I want to go deep in you. I want to go in a place where few go. I want my vineyard fully alive with you. I don't want the little areas constantly keeping me bound in carnality. These are just all the fears and the unclean speech and the un clean thought life and all the little attitudes that we, we just kind of say, well, we'll deal with them some other day. Those are the little foxes that destroy our intimacy with the Lord. We're never going to get in a scandal with those things, but we'll never have the intimacy that we're crying out for. 
He's calling her out of the comfort zone, but the little foxes are destroying her vineyard right now, and she's asking for help. The Lord said in verse 14, I want to hear your voice. Well, verse 15, she goes, well, then help me then. Here's my voice. Help me. She cries out. She goes, Lord, catch the little foxes for me. And then in verse 16, she goes, my beloved is mine and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. She says, help me. But she says, I'm not losing my confidence right now. Help me catch the foxes. My life is, my, my intimacy with God is in jeopardy right now. But I know that I'm still yours and you're mine. I'm not drawing back in this religious spirit of accusation. I know that you are mine and I am yours. I still understand that. But she says, I know something else. That you're only going to feed me in a deep place, in the place of the lilies. That's the purity. And I developed that where the, where the, uh, the picture of the lily speaks of purity. In chapter 2, verse 1, when she says, I am the lily, she's talking about in the gift of righteousness as she stands before God. In the court of God, she's completely pure and clean. Now she wants to be to live in the depth of purity in every place of her life. She wants every area of her life. She goes, I know you'll only feed me. I want you to sustain me. Remember chapter 2, verse 5. Sustain me and feed me with grapes and with raisins. Feed me, feed me, feed me. So in chapter 2, verse 8, he appears as the king. He goes, you really want me to feed you? You really feel lovesick? You want to go all the way with me? Well, then come with me. Leave the comfort zone. Stand with me. I've been faithful to you in the winter seasons. The natural history is winding down. Can't you see the harvest is here? I want you now to ask me for help. Enter into a prayer life. Your voice is, is, is sweet to me. Your face is lovely. I know you're weak. Cry out for help. Cry out for help because I'm only going to feed you the deep things in the midst of the lilies. I'm not going to feed you the deep things outside of purity. Yes, you can be saved and you're lovely in redemption, but I want to feed you deep things now. And she's going, oh, Lord, this, I knew this was going to happen. I'm out of the comfort zone, and I'm feeling, oh, I know you love me, and I know that I love you, but that's not the issue. I want to be fed in a deeper way than ever before. I'm at your table, but I want you to feed me on the lilies on purity. Bring me into realms of purity I never knew possible. Feed me those things now. Oh, I'm lovesick, and the Lord says, that's what I'm doing, but I'm, I'm causing you to face all the little foxes in your life right now. There are four times, four times in the song where the, you're going to see the, this, this page. <laughs> What's happening, and you could just read it on your own. What is happening is the, is the Lord is, is causing a progression of maturity to take place in her life. And it appears four times, and we're going to develop it one of the four times, but not right now. But I just want it there so you can look over it and become familiar with it. She acknowledges that Jesus will feed her. He wants to feed her the deep things that are only related to purity. He wants to bring her into realms of purity, depths of purity, like he is, like she's never known before. Okay, and I, right through page 23, we talk about why lilies are pure, and, and the study of lilies throughout the song is a fascinating study. <clears throat> Her painful compromise. She knows that she's a lover of God. Beloved, I love it. Her confidence is steadfast. She goes, I know that you're mine and I'm yours. I know that. And I know that I know that I know the only place you will feed me what I'm really hungering for is in the place of abandonment. And that's what I want. I'm lovesick. I asked you to feed me back in chapter 2, verse 5, and now you're going to feed me, but you're feeding me in a hard place, in the place of the lilies. And the Lord says, no, no, the lilies are fragrant. The lilies are beautiful. It's a beautiful place where I will feed you. You're just afraid right now. You just don't understand right now. See, in chapter 3, he shows himself as the safe God to her. And then chapter 4, it really picks up in chapter 4, 5, and 6. Again, many people just get stuck at chapter 1, verse 5. I am dark, and they stutter over. I'm lovely, kind of, sort of. I will be one day. And that's about as far as many, many people ever go. They stutter over I'm lovely, and they never press into anything beyond that. They just kind of wait it out until the Lord returns and can't wait for heaven. 
And there's such, there's so many measures and realms of the romance of God the Holy Spirit wants to beckon us into. Beloved, the church, I'm not saying this critical, I'm saying this as an invitation because I feel this invitation from the Lord for me. I believe the Lord's saying to his church, oh, I have so much more for you. I want to stun you with who I am. I am the God of Genesis 1. I want to beckon you into my embrace. We don't have to get stuck where the whole church across the earth, the Western world is stuck. We don't have to just be consumer Christians who are laboring and getting uh, an external, I mean, in our external, uh, I mean, laboring and Serving the Lord out, out there, getting our identity and our, and our honor from it, and that's our whole reward. We get burned out, and we get hurt, then we pout for a couple years, and, and we just, we're just consumer Christians, so many people. The Lord wants us to be passionate people who are captured in the romance. There's nothing in this world that, that sin can give us. His love is better than any of the wine of this world. It will thrill us and fascinate us. And yet the church in the earth right now is just somehow can, I mean, a Western world I'm really thinking of is so stuck on, okay, I'll do a few, I'll do a few ministries, but as long as the people like me, the anointing's there, and I get promoted regularly. And once that ceases to be, I'm out of here in about two or three years, if it doesn't work out good for me. The main guys don't like me, and the money doesn't come, and the anointing isn't strong, I'm out of here. And that's, that's, a, that's kind of a crass but somewhat truthful explanation, uh, description of the church in the Western world right now. It's so shallow. The Lord's saying, I'm the uncreated God, I want to marry you. I'm going to give you my beauty, I'm going to unfold myself. What are you talking about? I don't even want you living by your external rewards. I'll give them to you. But those aren't your primary rewards. It's the romance of your heart that has power in life. And no matter what they do to you, you can be in prison for years like Paul was, but your heart can overflow in power while you're in prison. Because I can romance you and stun you every step of the way. I'm the God that created you, and I created you for me. The Lord wants to feed us in the lilies, in the place of the lilies. We want to do it, don't we? But we're never going to have the power to do it without the romance. We'll never, ever, we'll never be able to overcome our craving for entertainment and recreation and all the things we do with our lives without the Lord uh, bringing us into this romance. She refuses to obey him. She tells him, turn, go leap on the mountains without me right now. Because she understands that he is the gazelle and the stag. He cannot change his personality, and he cannot change his mandate from the Father. She goes, I know I can't change you. I can't make you into a person who is just only going to live where I'm living right now. So I know you, and I know that you will only take me as I voluntarily say yes. Because the Lord is committed to the voluntary lover dimension. She says with pain, go be the gazelle and the stag that is within your heart to be and that the Father has mandated you to be. And I don't know what I'm going to do right now, but just go. I do love you. And it ends right there. I mean, what a tough way to end the night. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, she's disciplined. The Lord frees her heart from fear. Then chapter 3, verse 6 to 11, he shows himself as the safe God that has every provision to keep her heart safe. And then she explodes. She goes all the way. I mean, she says, well, in that case, what am I living so afraid? Amen. Let's stand. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.